Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be with you here this morning. Welcome to everyone joining us via YouTube. Announcements for you today. First, uh, we still need some folks to help out with being worship assistants. There is a sign-up sheet out on the welcome table. Uh, if you would like to help, we still need, for, in particular, uh, communion assistants who pick up the cups uh, after communion. Um, next weekend, we'll be taking our noisy offering uh, for the month, and this month our noisy offering is going to the Stepping Stone Shelter. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about Stepping Stone uh, in the announcement sheet. And then last but certainly not least, we are just shy of about $7,000 in our furnace fund uh, to help uh, replace those furnaces. Um, and so if you'd like more information, um, you can look at your announcements. Uh, this Thursday is the group. It's the third, oh, last Thursday, ah, so close. So, okay, so ignore what it says about the group. Put it off a week. Um, are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation this morning? Seeing none, we invite you to stand as you wish or you're able to turn to page 97 in your red hymnal as we begin with our Thanksgiving for baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Join to Christ in the waters of baptism. We are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our gathering hymn today is hymn 377 in your red hymnal. Alleluia, Jesus is risen, and we invite you to join in singing along.
on page 138 in the front part of your red hymnals. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all the Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, King Almighty God and Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, you made the disciples glad by the sight of the risen Lord. Remind us that he is always with us and that we now share in his resurrection. For he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from the third chapter of beginning with the 12th verse. Seeing this, Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by our own power or piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. This is the one you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. You rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, the very one whom God raised from the dead. You are witnesses of this. His name itself has made this man strong. That is, because of faith in Jesus' name, God has strengthened this man whom you see and know. The faith that comes through Jesus gave him complete health right before your eyes. Brothers and sisters, I know you acted in ignorance, so did your rulers, but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 4 responsibly. Answer me when I cry out, my righteous God. Set me free from my troubles. Have mercy on me. Listen to my prayer. How long, you people, will my reputation be insulted? How long will you continue to love what is worthless and go after lies? Know this. The Lord takes personal care of the faithful. The Lord will hear me when I cry out to him. So be afraid and don't sin. Think hard about it in your bed. And weep over it. Bring righteous offerings and trust the Lord. Many people say, we can't find goodness anywhere. The light of your face has left us, Lord. But you have filled my heart with more joy than when their wheat and wine are everywhere. I will lie down and fall asleep in peace, because you alone, Lord, let me live in safety. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 3. 
See what kind of love the Father has given to us, and that we should be called God's children, and that is what we are. Because the world didn't recognize him, it doesn't recognize us. Dear friends, now we are God's children, and it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we'll see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, even as he is pure. Every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion, and sin is rebellion. You know what you know that he appeared to take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Every person who remains in relationship to him does not sin. Any person who sins has not seen him or know him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The person who practices righteousness is righteous in the same way that Jesus is righteous. The person who practices sin belongs to the devil, because the devil has been sinning since the beginning. God's Son appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those born from God don't practice sin because God's DNA remains in them. They can't sin because they are born from God. This is how God's children and the devil's children are apparent. Everyone who doesn't practice righteousness is not from God including the person who doesn't love a brother or sister. This is the message that you heard from the beginning. Love each other. Don't behave like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he kill him? He killed him because his own works were evil, but the works of his brother were righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have transferred from death to life because we love the brothers and sisters. The person who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that murderers don't have eternal life residing in them. This is how we know love. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if someone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but refuses to help, how can the love of God dwell in a person like that? The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to Jesus. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were terrified and afraid. They thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you startled? Why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It's really me. Touch me and see, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. As he said this, he showed them his hands and feet, because they were wondering and questioning in the midst of their happenings. He said to them, Do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of baked fish. Taking it, he ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law from Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, This is what is written, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Now, I'm told I'm too young to be having senior moments, so I'm going to call this a junior moment. And uh, the brain's not firing on all cylinders this morning, so instead of taking you on a wild side quest through the many crevices of my mind, we're going to stick in the pulpit. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So let me ask you something. 
Can you even begin to imagine what it must have been like for the disciples on that very first Easter evening? After traveling with two of them to the town of Emmaus, Jesus finds a large number of his disciples holed up, doors locked tight, still terrified and grief-stricken after witnessing their Lord brutally killed just days before. Then, bam! Before they can understand what's going on, there he is, Jesus himself suddenly appearing there right in their midst. But it's not like some ghost or spirit. No, this is Jesus in living color and full body and flesh. They can see the very wounds from his crucifixion. It's almost too much for them to handle. It's too incredible to process. Their reaction is a lot more understandable when you think about it this way, right? And thinking about our gospel lesson from this perspective, I'm reminded of a crazy story from, well, quite a while back, because it was happening in Yugoslavia. Now, there was a judge, and this judge got electrocuted, and he was pronounced dead. But then, right in the middle of the night, he wakes up in the morgue. He tries frantically to let people know that he's alive. He calls out for his wife, his neighbors, anyone who will hear him. Only nobody believes him. They think it's some kind of sick prank because, I mean, how's a dead guy supposed to come back to life like that? But as unbelievable as it seemed, he really was alive against all odds. And well, friends, if that judge being resurrected was a hard pill to swallow, the resurrection of Jesus Christ takes the cake as the most mind-blowing event in all of human history. This wasn't just some partial revival or spiritual experience. Jesus, no, he physically, bodily rose again after being crucified, certified dead, and in the tomb for three days. By being resurrected, he began the greatest revolution the world has ever seen. Think about it. E ever since Adam and Eve's failure to follow God's one rule in the garden, the entire human race has been trapped under sin's brutal reign of terror. Destined for death, powerless against the evil forces of darkness with zero ability to free ourselves or make ourselves right with God, we were utterly doomed, unless there was a divine intervention. And that's exactly what the resurrection of Jesus provides. You see, his suffering, death on the cross, and resurrection happened exactly as foretold in the scriptures that pointed to God's promised Messiah. And it is through his death and resurrection that Jesus delivered the knockout blow to sin, death, and the devil. It's like Christ accomplished a daring jailbreak, busting us out of the enemy's prison of sin and death once and for all. He took the full force of evil's onslaught, and then he flexed his divine muscle overpowering every foe and rising triumphant as the victor. Talk about an underdog story for the ages. And that's why the resurrection is the absolute foundation and the starting point for the entirety of the Christian faith. As the scholar N.T. Wright put it, quote, if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is risen, nothing else matters. You see, if Jesus had just died a martyr's death but never defeated death itself, then we're all still hopelessly trapped in with no hope of salvation. But because he conquered the grave, sin's curse is reversed. Eternal life is opened up, and every single one of us now has the chance to experience true freedom and true forgiveness as God's redeemed and loved children. 
And friends, that's exactly what Jesus tells his stunned disciples in our reading from the Gospel of St. Luke. Immediately after proving his bodily resurrection, Jesus commissions his disciples with the spreading of this gospel message of repentance and forgiveness to every nation on earth. You could call it the launch of the greatest grassroots revolution in history. But this isn't some man-made political uprising. This is the cosmic revolution of God reclaiming his creation from the chaos and the evil that imprisoned it. And it is the raising up of a new humanity that is restored and freed in Christ. That's why we begin by turning our allegiances from sin and self-centeredness, and that we begin to surrender ourselves to Christ as our true Lord and King. And as we do, as we place our trust in our risen Savior, his Holy Spirit changes us from the inside out, making us one with God's family, setting us free from our old tyrants of sin and death. It's a whole new way of living, my friends, and it is fueled by Christ's resurrection power, which is unleashed within us. Now, I know that this can sound pretty wild, pretty far out. Talk of bodily resurrections, defeating spiritual forces, becoming a new creation. No, it is not the new Marvel movie. But yet, it still blows even my own mind. And apparently, it was the same for those first disciples. You see, Jesus had to supernaturally open their minds before they could truly grasp what the scriptures were saying about the Messiah and his mission. Our human minds are just not capable of properly understanding these heavenly mysteries apart from the Holy Spirit's enlightenment. So in that upper room, Jesus breathes on the disciples and he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He opens their eyes to see the truth. He gives them spiritual understanding. He equips them to be his witnesses, to spread his revolutionary message to the ends of the earth and beyond. And it is the same outpouring of the Spirit is that we need today. But the thing is, we can't just share this gospel through human power and human wisdom alone. Now, like those earliest disciples, we too need God's Spirit opening our minds and empowering us as ambassadors of this resurrection revolution. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us as we go out to our neighborhoods, to our communities, and to the world with this joyful proclamation that the crucified Jesus has risen from the grave. That through his resurrection victory, any and every person can now be forgiven, set free, and brought into God's eternal kingdom as we turn ourselves from our selfish desires, our worldly perspectives, and we surrender all that we are to God. That's a high calling, my friends, but it is ours to take this resurrection revolution to the masses, to be willing witnesses of the reality-shaking news that Jesus Christ has defeated sin, death, and even the powers of hell themselves through his res resurrection, and that through him the devil's oppressive kingdom is overthrown, and the bright dawn of God's new creation has begun breaking through into this very present. It's a wildly incredible and mind-bending message. No person could ever dream up something this staggeringly beautiful and powerful. But thanks be to God, it's not a fantasy. It is the truth. Our Savior is resurrected, our old identities are transformed, and we are fully and utterly reborn as citizens of Christ's eternal kingdom. So my friends, 
Let's go out as the revolutionaries that we are, shining the light of Christ into all even the back recesses of the world, calling people to turn from sin's alluring call to experience the forgiveness and the resurrection power of Jesus. It may seem like an impossible cause, but our King has already won the decisive victory. And now it's time to live out that resurrection revolution and to join Christ in setting the captives free. But also remember this. The resurrection revolution isn't just some fleeting novelty or a temporary movement. No, the conquering power of Christ's resurrection life is an unstoppable force that radically transforms all of those who bear witness to it. Remember back to those first disciples. After the resurrection, Jesus doesn't simply celebrate with them and then abandon them, leaving them to their own devices to figure things out alone. No, he graciously remains with them, teaching them, opening their eyes to the scriptures, pouring out his spirit upon them. He molds them from the inside out into bold proclaimers of his victory over sin and death. And you see, Jesus' way is never just to drop truth on us and to let us figure it out alone. In those critical days after that first Easter, he prepared the disciples and grounded them in his word before he sent them out proving to us that when we hear the good news of his resurrection triumph, the living Christ similarly comes to us to take up residence in our lives through the Holy Spirit. Jesus enlightens our hearts and our minds. He gives us a new identity and a new life. But he also gives us a purpose as death-defying ambassadors of his eternal kingdom. Jesus' resurrection isn't just a historical spectacle to be amazed by once a year. No, it is rather the source of an entirely new, abundant, and eternal life that we are shepherded into by him. So as we go forth as revolutionaries in the name of our risen king, may that same powerful, unstoppable force that raised Jesus from the dead be at work within us as we spread the amazing news of his gospel everywhere. So what do you say? Are you ready? Because if you are, let's take this resurrection revolution, this Jesus revolution out on the road, not just to Emmaus, but to every corner of the world that needs to hear it. And because he lives All God's people say, Amen. Our hymn of the day today is found on the insert in your bulletin. It is called, Touch That Soothes and Heals. And we invite you to stand as you wish or you are able.
Our service continues on page 105 in the front part of your red hymnal. And so now let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We join our hearts and voices to offer our prayers to God. O oh God, our Holy One, you feed our deepest hungers as we share the holy meal that is the body and blood of Jesus given for us. Lead us and share all lead us to share all that we have and find in generosity, abundant life. Send out send our minds on set our minds on heavenly things and fill us with your joy. O oh God, our creator, you bring forth all life on earth. Calm storms and bring water to parched places so that this planet can sustain life in all its variety. Set our minds on heavenly things and fill us with your joy. O oh God, our Savior, you offer wisdom and guidance beyond all human knowledge. Instruct lawmakers, judges, and elected officials to make decisions grounded in your justice and care for all people. Set our minds on heavenly things and, and fill us with, with your joy. O oh God, our elder, you care for all your children. Encourage those who are in times of transition, facing the loss of old ways and routines and anticipating change. Guide those who journey in grief, hope, and uncertainty. Set our minds on <laughs> heavenly things and, and fill us, us with, with your joy. joy. O oh God, our center, you bring all people together in you. Help us to remember our identity and purpose in our ministry. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share in beloved community. Today, we lift up these members and friends, William, Jacqueline, Phyllis, Eric, Lindsay, Erilyn, and Emery. Send our minds set our minds on heavenly things and, and fill us with your joy. O oh God, our resting place, your son Jesus promised that we are held in your love forever. We remember our beloved who have died. As we remember and share their love, comfort those who mourn. Set our minds on heavenly things and, and fill us with, with your joy. joy. Help us listen closely to your word even as you listen closely to our prayers. Amen. Amen. It is at this point in our service in which we will receive our offering of gifts and tithes. It is these gifts and tithes that allow St. Luke United Lutheran to be a place where the people of God gather, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then to prepare our hearts and our minds to go out into the world sharing the good news of the resurrection revolution.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, our self, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We invite you to stand as you wish or you are able. Our service continues on page 144 in the front part of your red hymnal.
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened, us, opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymns. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. To us in the breaking of the bread. Come and eat at God's table. You may be seated. For those who are visiting with us today, please know that this is God's table, and at God's table, everyone is welcome. So you are most certainly invited to come and to receive Holy Communion with us today. Our communion hymn today, uh, unless we have special music, uh, will be hymn 470 in your red hymnals.
We invite you to stand as you wish or you are able. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Alleluia. Amen. Our sending hymn today is hymn 366 in your red hymnals. The strife is o'er, the battle done. <laughs> 